15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello once again, and thank you for joining us on Space Nuts, where we talk astronomy, space science, sometimes technology, sometimes we talk about recipes, uh, you name it, it uh, it's fair game on this show. Uh, and uh, coming up on this episode, uh, 291, we'll be talking about uh, something you may well have heard mentioned in the news, and that is that Earth has picked up a Trojan asteroid. Yep, uh, and it's going to be sticking with us for a little while from what I've read. Uh, and I, I got a, a message the other day uh, from someone wondering if the James Webb Space Telescope um, could try and find Oumuamua, which I affectionately refer to as the Space Doogie because it's, you know, cigar-shaped. Uh, well, uh, maybe not. I'm, I'm thinking it's too small for James Webb and probably too fast, but there is... A possibility that they will go after it. So that's uh, that's in the news as well. And uh, an interesting story about a volcanic lake that has life in it. How so? And what does that mean for the potential for life beyond Earth? And we're going to tackle a question from Michael in Kent who uh, wants to know, once we land on Mars, what's the first thing we're going to do? Well, more specifically, what are you going to do, Fred? Uh, I know what I'll do. I'll tell you when we get to that part of the story. Uh, my name is Andrew Dunkley, your host, and joining me as always is astronomer at large, Professor Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. Hi, Andrew. How's it going? Oh, it's going really well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, no complaints yeah. whatsoever. That's good. I'm glad to hear it. Um, usually we have plenty, but not today. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could complain, but then that would use up all our airtime and all that. we wouldn't be able to talk about astronomy. <laughs> we could complain about that as well. We, 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 we can throw in anything. <laughs> yes, um, yes. Do I dare use the term whinging pom, Fred? Do I? Well, I don't look, you know, it's, um, it's water for ducks, man. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> of course it is. Okay, uh, let's go to our first story. And this one is uh, really interesting because Earth has picked up a companion uh, known as a Trojan asteroid, and it's sharing our orbit and it will be sticking around for a little while. What's the story here? This is this is a fairly newish type of discovery, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it's, it actually is the second uh, known Trojan uh, of the Earth. Uh, let me get the details out of the way by telling you what it's called. It's called 2020XL5. Oh, I don't mind that uh, one. Yeah, it's not bad, is it? It's quite, it sort of rolls off the tongue. Um, it, it's the second one. Um, the first one <laughs> was 2010 TK7. Oh, okay. that's not is, bad either. Actually, um, <laughs> we're getting a new car in a few months and it's a 2020 XL5. So there you go. <laughs> well, it's perfect. That's very good. <laughs> um, <clears throat> mine's a 2018 ASX, which also sort of, you know, rolls off the tongue as well. Anyway, never mind all that. Um, <clears throat> what is it? What's a Trojan? Mm. Uh, it is a kind of asteroid, and they were really first discovered uh, in the context of the planet Jupiter, because Jupiter has something like 11,000 of these things in tow. Uh, we've got two on Earth. Um, what, what are they? They are asteroids that congregate in the two Lagrange points that are in the same orbit as the planet. Let's just talk about Jupiter for the, for the moment, yep. the same orbit as Jupiter. Um, but they're centered 60 degrees ahead of Jupiter and 60 degrees behind Jupiter in its orbit. And these are the two Lagrange points we've talked about Lagrange points many times. There are five of them where the, the mutual gravity of two objects, in this case, the sun and Jupiter balance out and give you a gravitational null point. Uh, but the, but the, so they're, they're called L1 to L5 and L4 and L5 are the ones that are actually in the orbit of the planet. So in this case, Jupiter, uh, the other three L1 to L3, they are basically along the line, uh, joining the sun and the planet. Mm. Made that clear? Yeah, yep. I think so. Yep. With, with the most obvious one being the one between 
the Sun and Jupiter. That's the L1 point where just the gravity balances out between the two. And L2 but, has been in the news because that's where James Webb is. Exactly. That's right. That's on the other side of the planet. So that's the Earth L2 point. Yep. So, uh, yeah, Jupiter has these L4 and L5 points, the ones in its own orbit, and they have gathered up over the millennia, uh, the, these clouds of debris. So the Jupiter Trojans, um, and in fact, um, that, that I can't remember which way around it is, uh, they, the, there are two groups, the L4 group and the L5 group. One group is called the Greeks and the other group is called the Trojans. I can't remember <laughs> which way around it, but that's where the name comes from. It's the idea of the Trojan Wars. Um, you probably haven't seen it, Andrew, but I've done a, I've got a picture of the Jupiter Trojans in, uh, in space war. Oh, uh, I, it, it's a picture of what they look like and they all seem to look a bit like horses with little wheels on the bottom of them, but I was quite happy with that <laughs> cartoon when it came out. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, so we've got these two clouds of, uh, of, of asteroids, uh, which are of great interest. And you and I have spoken about this before, because there is a mission, <clears throat> excuse me, on its way, uh, to visit the Jupiter Trojans, which is called Lucy. Um, and we, we discussed that a few weeks ago. Um, r let's come back though, to the case of the earth, mm. because of course the earth is a planet. So you've got this gravitational interaction between the sun and the earth. And that means that the earth too has its Lagrange points. And you're absolutely right. L2, the one beyond the earth, out, um, on the direction away from the sun, that is where, uh, the James Webb space telescope is now located, uh, along with a number of other objects, uh, like the W map that was the Wilkinson microwave and isotropy probe. Uh, the Gaia spacecraft is there too. There's all gang of spacecraft. Now they're, they're not all trying to be sitting at exactly this one point, um, which would be a bit uncomfortable for all these spacecraft. But what they are doing is they're orbiting around that null point. So there's room for plenty of, of spacecraft there. James Webb is not likely to run into any of these other ones. So that's the L2 point. But the Earth, of course, has L4 and L5 points as well. Mm. Um, L4 being ahead of the Earth in its orbit, L5 being behind. And back in 2010, um, this uh, Trojan asteroid was discovered, 2010 TK7, uh, an object about 300 meters in diameter. And it's, um, it's been, re well, relatively well studied. There's not much known about it. It's very, very faint because it's so small. Uh, but now, uh, the, and the reason why we're talking about this, cause it's in the news, uh, an international team, uh, led actually by a Spanish group, actually, uh, University of Alicante, uh, and the Institute of Cosmos Sciences of the University of Barcelona. Uh, they have basically confirmed that this, uh, asteroid 2020 XL5 is a Trojan asteroid. Uh, and it's an, more interesting than the other one, partly because it's bigger. It's about a kilometer, if I remember rightly, thereabouts, mm. uh, I think 1100 meters or something of that sort. Um, but it is also, uh, it's, it's a, a carbonaceous asteroid. It's a C type asteroid, which in fact is the commonest kind, but it means it's rich in, in carbon compounds. So it's, you know, it's a sort of pristine remnant from the, the, the solar system. Uh, and I guess that sort of begs the question, well, should we go and visit I it? I was have a look at going it? to ask you that. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you Well, might. it's an opportunity, <laughs> isn't it? It is. Yes, that's right. Um, the, the, uh, understanding I have at the moment, Andrew, is that there are no immediate plans because the, you know, because we've got this mission already on its way to the, uh, uh to the, the Jupiter Trojans. Yeah. Um, and that's going to, um, if I remember rightly, it's going to fly by eight asteroids, one of which is in the main belt and the other seven are Trojan asteroids. So it's going to have a really good look at these. Um, and that will tell us a lot, but, um, you know, what, what will happen is that, um, telescopes here on earth will certainly make a point of studying, uh, the, the Jupiter, sorry, the earth Trojan, the new earth Trojan, um, and. In, in particular, the first thing that you, <clears throat> excuse me, the first thing that you study with one of these is the stability of its orbit, the, the dynamics of how it's behaving in this, um, in this gravitational well. 
And if I remember rightly, I don't have this in front of me at the moment, but it's thought that uh, within 4,000 years, I think that is yep, correct. that's the number I can see. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, we're going to lose it uh, because the gravitational, you know, it, it will not be a stable uh, orbit. It's not, not stable enough to, to hang on to. Uh, to hang on to this Trojan. How, how did they the, come uh, up with the number of, of 4,000 years? How do they know that that's the time frame? Um, basically, just by fast forwarding, because you can, you know, orbital dynamics are incredibly robust ah. when you take into account the, just the gravitational pull of the, the objects in question. So it's not just the gravitational pull of the earth and the sun that are involved here. The moon is also uh, tugging on this Trojan, as are the other planets. Mm. Um, and if you add to that a little bit of an impulse coming from the solar wind, there's always that as well, that the, this breeze of subatomic particles that's constantly blowing through the inner solar system. Uh, if you put all of those um, together in a monstrous computer program and then run it forward, it tells you how stable the orbit is. There'll be, you know, parameters that give you the stability of the orbit. And when that drops below a certain number, then you know you're going to lose it. Mm. It's actually, um, um, I'm, this is a total aside, Andrew, but um, about 150 years ago, <laughs> it's not quite that long. Uh, my master's degree, uh, which was a research degree, I wrote computer programs for determining the orbits of asteroids. That's what I did because back then computer programs were a novel thing. Um, and so my, my, um, my thesis was called practical techniques for the determination of minor planet orbits because asteroid was not considered a proper word in those mm. days. Uh, and so I know a little bit about the kind of computations that are involved with this. And I mean, the stuff I was doing then was, you know, totally prehistoric compared with the software oh, that's being operated yeah. today. It, it reminds me, Fred, of when I uh, studied <laughs> in college, I, um, I did a computer class uh, as one of the subjects and yeah. it was one hour, uh, per week for the, for the, for the one year of the four year course. So they, they didn't put a lot of focus on computer, <laughs> um, right. uh, it was actually learning to write code and things like that. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah it's right. just, they, there wasn't much focus on it back then. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the most, no, uh, right. the most powerful computer around at that time in my place was a, uh, a Casio, com uh, calculator. Oh, yeah. <laughs> calculator. Yeah. 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 Now yeah. I do notice Fred that, um, yeah. Okay. We've now got two Trojans and you said what Jupiter's got about 11,000 or something. Yeah. Uh, Neptune's yep. got 32, they say. Yeah, that's right. And Mars has yes. got nine and not surprise, not surprisingly, Uranus has got one. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, the, the Mars having nine is interesting, but I guess you can equate that to the fact that Mars is right next door to the main asteroid mm. belt. So some of those, uh, some of those might well be, you know, captured objects that have dumped themselves into this gravitational well. Yeah. Uh, in the orbit of so that, that would suggest uh, I, then that there are more Lagrange points further out that, you know, we, we go yeah. L1 to L5 cause they're in our vicinity, but further out, there are others. Yes. That, that each planet has its own. So, you know, every, every planet has its own L1 to L5, um, and, and, uh, as do asteroids and dwarf planets. So Pluto would have an, an L1 to L5. Um, actually, which wouldn't be that different from the, the Neptune ones because Pluto's orbit is not, <clears throat> not that much bigger than Neptune. It's, um, it's elongated, uh, but within, uh, at its closest Pluto comes within the orbit of Neptune. So it's that neck of the woods. Uh, yeah, re really interesting stuff. And you know, something else that this issue raises, which is quite interesting is the possibility of looking at the Lagrange points of exoplanets, ah. uh, see what we might find there when we've got telescopes that are powerful enough to do that. That will be interesting. Yeah. I suppose, um, it's like we speculated for a long time, whether or not other solar systems existed beyond ours yes. and we've proved that's yep. true. And we're starting to learn more and more about those exoplanets. And some of them are very much like the ones in our solar system. And some of them are very, very weird indeed, but, um, it, it stands to reason that what's happening here would be happening in many, many other places in the universe probably millions of times over. That's right. 
Yes, that absolutely right. Because, um, you know, uh, the, the, it, because the laws of physics are the same everywhere. That's the bottom line. Uh, so what happens here is going to tend to happen elsewhere as well. Mm, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, 2020 XL5, we've got plenty of time to decide whether or not we want to go and visit it. It's going to be hanging around for yes. about 4,000 years, which is probably just enough time for bureaucrats to make a decision. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they start thinking about it now, they'll, they'll probably manage it. That's Indeed. Right. <laughs> You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Professor Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and keying with a go. Space Nuts. Now, if you are a social media follower, uh, you can follow us on social media, which is very convenient. Uh, it's a good way to stay in touch with what's happening with Space Nuts. You can do that on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, you can also join the Space Nuts podcast group on Facebook, which is a, um, a gathering of people who listen to the show that uh, can chat to each other, share their photographs, uh, share their stories, share their jokes, uh, all that kind of thing. So, um, yes, uh, social media is a, is a good platform for us, uh, not only to stay in touch with you, but also for you to stay in touch with us and each other. So check it out, Space Nuts, the official Facebook page, Space Nuts podcast group on Facebook and our Instagram page. We're on Twitter as well, if you're a, a Twitter user. Uh, I, I'm on all of them. I don't know how to use any of them, but I'm there. <laughs> now, Fred, uh, we're going to discuss one of my favorite subjects because uh, a few years ago now, um, there was a flyby of Earth by a large interstellar object. It was um, a Mua, Mua uh, which passed through our solar system. We didn't know it till it had got past, so yikes. Um, and because of its uh, incredible shape, and um, I've already made references to something like this in the program about Uranus, but uh, it, I call it the space doogie because that's what it looks like. And um, yeah, we've had people sort of jokingly saying, oh, well, you know, why don't we go after it? Uh, can we get pictures of it? What does it look like? Uh, and I think I tongue in cheek said, well, there's a Tesla out there. Why can't we go after it in, in Elon's car? Well, now it looks like they're thinking about it. Yes, Not necessarily in the, the Tesla, in the tes Tesla <laughs> bit. Yeah, uh, they are. That's right. Well, you know, um, people are fixated they, by this. They certainly object. are. <clears throat> uh, as well, you, you being one of them. Um, but the, uh, just to, uh, catch up a little bit on it. So it was back in October, 2017 that Oumuamua passed through the solar system. Its name comes from a Hawaiian word, meaning first visitor, first messenger from a mm. father, I think something of that sort. And what the, the, the only observations that we have of it, Andrew, uh, are to do with its brightness and its color. Cause that's all you can see with big telescopes I and mean, telescopes were focused on it as soon as we knew about it, because it, it as you said, it, it had already passed its closest when, uh, when it was discovered. The key thing, I guess, was that it has this extraordinary light curve. And by that, I mean, the way it's brightness varies over time. Um, I can't remember, I think it, is it 40 minutes or something? It's a long time since I've looked at this, but it's, t it, it, it's brightness varied enormously over a short period of time and quite regularly. And when you fit, when you model what that's telling you is that the first thing that came out of it was the possibility that it was essentially shaped like a cigar or a French breadstick or anything else you want to compare <laughs> it with, uh, long and thin. Um, I think, uh, quite long, actually, if I remember rightly, it was, uh, you know, more than a hundred meters long, um, in the modeling. Um, and so that modeling was what was taken as red for a long time, uh, that it was cigar shaped effectively. <clears throat> and, um, that coupled with the color, uh, which you can also measure pretty easily from ground based telescopes, because you, 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 all these things are points of light, so you can measure it how it varies over time in, in brightness and how it, what its color looks like. And its color is quite red, quite okay. reddish. Um, so those two facts all fed into <clears throat> our current understanding. But then I think it was last year, Andrew, you and I did talk about this. Some new modeling was done that suggests that no, 
it's not actually cigar shaped because something else that fits it is basically the shape of a saucer mm. uh, or, a, or a dinner plate, that it's a flattened disc that's also tumbling. And um, more work was done on the coloration. And it turns out that it was an exact match uh, with the reddish areas of Pluto, yep. which are thought to be made of nitrogen ice. There's a kind of covering of nitrogen ice on parts of Pluto. And so uh, the theory then was that what we were seeing was this shard of solid nitrogen, um, uh, which uh, basically had probably been knocked off a Pluto-like object in a distant solar yeah. system by a collision and flung out of that solar system and, and is sort of heading through space. And I just thought, I've just remembered a bit more about um, why that was seen as a good model. And the, the idea is that uh, as it gets near the sun, the nitrogen sublimes, it turns from, uh, from a solid into a vapor mm. and, uh, it behaves a bit like, um, and there's one in my bathroom right now, a bit like those nearly worn down pieces of soap that you wind up with, uh, before you say, this is ridiculous and throw it yep. in the bin, um, a, a thin shard of material because that, that's what, that, that's what this sublimation process would do. It's just wearing it down. And that, that I think there was some, at least thinking, maybe not evidence so, so much, but the idea that uh, as, as Oumuamua passed ne near the sun, it had actually lost some of its mm. nitrogen, although there was no sign of that. That was, that was the, the thing. And let, let me just re, I mean, this is a big recap on Oumuamua, but let's throw into the mix, um, the, the other, uh, aspect of it, which is that it was demonstrated to have non-gravitational forces acting on it. In other words, it wasn't just the gravity of the planets and the sun that were dictating the way it moved. There was evidence that, um, there was some other force, which was thought to be this outgassing process as, as material, uh, as vapor leaves the, the, um, the surface of Oumuamua, it gives a thrust in the opposite direction. Um, that led uh, certain well-known astrophysicists to postulate whether, in fact, this was an out-of-control alien spacecraft, which was leaking fuel or something of that sort. Um, so that, and, and because you, you, you've got no way of disproving that, in fact, um, that no way at all. Uh, so you've still got all these possibilities. It's a cigar or it's a worn down piece yeah. of soap or it's an alien spacecraft. Um, and that's why people are saying, oh my God, we've got to chase after this thing. And so scientists have looked at exactly that. How can you do it? And the answer is not quickly. Yes, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there is, there is a, something called, uh, Project Lyra, uh, which I think was initiated as a result of Oumuamua. And this is one way of looking, uh, you know, you know, one of the, one of the projects that's actually looked at the possibility of chasing after an interstellar object and rendezvousing mm. with it. Um, so, uh, that group and other groups, uh, have looked at what you could do and how you do it. And the problem is, uh, you know, Oumuamua is moving at 23 or probably more now, or probably a bit less actually, because it's moving further away. Uh, but it's that sort of order of kilometers per second. Every second that goes by, it's 20 odd kilometers further, further that's, away. And so you've got a big chase. Big job to that's catch, a huge chase. To catch up. It, it, it's a huge chase. That's right. Uh, and to cut to the chase, sorry for the pump. Um, uh, the Lyra group has published uh, I think I'm getting this right. There's several, several groups here in, involved with this, um, uh, actually with, with, uh, with this work, uh, how you would do it, but, but a number of articles have been published, uh, some of which use the idea of a solar yeah. sail, uh, and, you know, and we've talked about that before. And of course, breakthrough Starshot, uh, which is, a uh, one of the breakthrough projects has looked at the possibility of solar sailing to Proxima Centauri. Mm. Um, and so there's this, you know, a bit of interest in that kind of technology. Uh, so there is 
there is uh, interest in a solar sail. But there's also interest, Andrew, in some very clever maneuvers to boost your spacecraft out of the solar system to get on the tail of, of Oumuamua. Um, and these are a bit different from the standard gravity assist things, which you and I have talked about many times, where you fly a, your spacecraft close to a planet and it gives you know, some of the momentum of the planet is transferred to your spacecraft and gives it a boost. Um, there is, there's something called a solar obert or obert maneuver, which is, um, a way of, uh, you basically give your spacecraft a kick when you're moving as fast as you're going to in the orbit. In other words, at well, in the case of the sun, perihelion. Perihelion is where your spacecraft is at, at its closest yep. to the sun on an elliptical orbit. And if you give the spacecraft a kick at that point, then that gives you a bit of extra yep. oomph. Um, that's putting it very, very crudely. I'm sorry, any any um, astrodynamicists who are listening to this, you should just switch <laughs> off now. Um, but uh, that's that's kind of the way it works. But there is a suggestion of actually doing a similar thing but not using the sun, but uh -huh. Jupiter, uh, using a Jupiter Obert maneuver. Um, and so, you know, the, the bottom line is when you add all this stuff together, you could possibly catch up with um, Oumuamua in a journey time of 26 years. If you launch to do that by 2028, because you've got to get Jupiter in the right place to do it. Uh, which, so, which by my know, calculations so you, means that if, if they do follow through with this plan and do it in the timing yep. we're talking about, they will intercept a Muamua in 2054. That's exactly what I yep. calculated as well. That's right. Uh, 2054. Yeah. So, and we'll be uh, there to report it. Well, I, I hope I will be. 2054, Andrew, I'll be 109. Well, it's possible. And, um, it's not impossible, but it's unlikely. But if I talk garbage now, I imagine what I'm going to talk. Yeah, I'll be 92. <laughs> yeah. Oh, mm. dear. Well, it's something to look forward to. I mean, uh, what we can look forward to, maybe, is the launch of yeah. this thing because that in itself will be very exciting. And you might say, well, okay, we're not going to make it probably to, to see it, um, to see the rendezvous. <clears throat> so we might never know what Oumuamua really is, but, um, it, it's yeah, yeah. At least we'd, we'd have the knowledge that somebody had done something yes, about exactly. it. Exactly. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a rare <laughs> opportunity, isn't it? We've only had two of these things that we know of. Yes, that's right. But, but I think your point there is, is points actually towards what we really should be doing about this and maybe a better way of dealing with it. Um, and this has also been pr uh, proposed in, in the wake of Oumuamua. Um, because our telescopes are always improving because we're always able to see fainter objects. There's a lot of interest in solar You're system objects. You're going to say we're going to catch one objects. coming rather than chase. We need, yeah, we need to find yeah. another one. Uh, we need to find it early enough that it's going to be intercepted as it passes through the inner solar system. A few um, pundits have suggested that what we need is a ring of uh, spacecraft, uh, uh, pr probably spread around the orbit of Venus or maybe the Earth, that sort of area, maybe at Lagrange yep. points, actually, L4 and L5. You put a spacecraft there, you park it there, uh, all ready to go, all fueled up uh, with it, all its sensors and all the rest of it. And as soon as one of these things comes by, you set off your spacecraft to, to intercept it because it's all ready to go. All you've got to do is I like that on. idea. And I, I think that's yeah. a better idea. Yeah. Because you and I might get to see what the answer is. Yeah. Well, that's true too. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I know you've got yeah. to be patient when it comes to astronomy and observations, but, um, yeah, 26 years plus 28, <laughs> not my idea of fun, <laughs> but, but you know, not worth really, pursuing no. perhaps, but, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe yeah, we yeah. could just park the planet in front of it and catch it that way and make a movie just about it. Touch it that's already been there. Well, then you, yeah, then you'd have another it problem. Would, you know, for, you know. would indeed. Yeah. But, uh, no, fascinating <laughs> yeah. that they're, they're considering the possibility. <laughs> this is Space Nuts. Thanks for your company. Andrew Dunkley here with Fred Watson. Okay. We checked all four systems and seeing with a go. Space Nuts.
Thanks again to our patrons who put a little bit of money in our bucket every month to um, support the show. Uh, if you would like to be a patron, you can jump on our website to find out more, spacenutspodcast.com, and just click on the supporter tab or button or whatever it is. Uh, and uh, thanks to those who've been giving us reviews on their uh, various podcast platforms. We appreciate that, and please keep them coming. Another thing you can do on our website is buy us a cup of coffee. I love coffee. I am a coffee addict. So, um, yes, uh, that, that's another way of supporting us without having to, you know, break the bank. So uh, you can do that all via our website, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. Now, Fred, uh, we have in the past talked about some of the harsh conditions that exist in the universe and whether or not life could survive. And we've seen, you know, experiments with um, tardigrades on the International Space Station surviving the vacuum of space. Uh, and now uh, another piece of that puzzle may well have been revealed in that they have, um, they have been looking at um, a, a particular volcanic lake that... Um, has life is that what they're saying yeah mm. exactly that um an interesting story so this, this story takes us to costa rica uh where the i think it's poash pronounced volcano has a hydrothermal crater lake uh whose name is laguna caliente Ooh. how's your spanish uh, about that good laguna Caliente means hot lake. <laughs> of course it does. So <laughs> it tells you, tells you exactly yeah. what you want to know. Um, it's a hot lake. It's kind of steams away because it's in the crater. So it's heated geothermally. Uh, however, this lake is interesting because it is highly acidic, uh, and it's, it's got high concentrations of toxic materials, including metals. Um, the, uh, the fizz.org article on this, uh, and I love their language, uh, uh, I'm quoting here, it says the temperatures range from comfortable to <laughs> boiling. <laughs> so, so uh, it's yeah. pretty, it's a pretty grim environment. Plus you've got these occasional steam eruptions where you've got, you know, uh, they're called uh, phreatic eruptions where the, the heat, heated water just explodes, basically. And there was a the famous eruption. case many, many years ago in, oh, is it Ethiopia or somewhere like that, where one of these lakes yes. actually erupted and killed um, hundreds That's of right. people and thousands of cattle because of the carbon dioxide gas, I think it was. Uh, yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. Yes, I remember that. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, I think it may have it may have been even. Yeah, it was, it was a com big. Com it was a large details. number of people. Uh, they just suffocated, basically. Yeah. Yes, because mm. the CO two. Yeah, horrible, yeah. horrible. Anyway, um, uh, this lake uh, Laguna Caliente has been studied by uh, scientists at the University of Colorado Boulder in USA. A lot of planetary work goes on there. Um, and, uh, well, what did they find? Uh, it's, it's got microbes yeah. in it. Um, uh, but it's only one species, uh, of extremophile. Um, it's, uh, a group of microbes whose name is not surprisingly acidophilium, uh, acid lover, I guess is what it translates <laughs> as, uh, acidophilium. Um, and it, it's, it's apparently found, uh, it, it's fairly commonly known. Uh, you know, in acidic environments, uh, elsewhere, but this particular environment is so extreme that people have been surprised to find thriving colonies of, uh, mm. acidophilium and, uh, what's, what's been studied just to sort of, uh, cut a long story short is the way, um, this, you know, the, um, the diversity of exact species among this genus of acidophilium, uh, this particular species of microbe, the way they have changed over time. Um, because, uh, there've been, there have been eruptions. I think the, 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 the university of Colorado Boulder group have visited a number of times, uh, starting in 2013, I think, uh, again in 2017 and looked at the way these organisms have changed. It, in particular, in the diversity of exact, you know, um, species between the, 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 
the, the, the different classes of acidophilian. Uh, and, uh, really this, uh, and, uh, and other species, I should say, because it's, it's, uh, acidophilia is dominant, but I think there are other extremophiles. And yeah. I'm, I'm sort of garbling a bit here, but, but basically, um, I, I'm going to quote actually once again from the FIS.org, uh, report on this, because it, it's really interesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, and puts it con more concisely than I can. Through, through DNA sequencing of the organisms in the lake samples, the team confirmed that the bacteria had a wide variety of biochemical capabilities to potentially help them tolerate extreme and dynamic conditions. These included pathways to create energy using sulfur, iron, arsenic, carbon fixation like plants, both simple and complex sugars and bioplastic granules which microorganisms can create and use as energy and carbon reserves during st stress or, or, or uh, foundation, uh, sorry, stress or sa starvation. Mm. Um, it, it's uh, one of the, one of the scientists involved with this says, and this is a quote, we expected a lot of the genes that we found, but we didn't expect this many given the lake's low biodiversity. This was quite a surprise, but it's absolutely elegant. It makes sense that this is how life would adapt to living in an active volcano yeah. lake. Um, and of course, the reason why you and I are talking about this uh, on Space Nuts, Andrew, is because uh, there are similar environments we know uh, or did exist on yep. the planet Mars, that uh, hydrothermal areas, areas of hot springs on Mars, um, it, it's, uh, it's that, that's the, the big connection. Uh, so another quote from uh, one of the authors, our research provides a framework for how earth life could have existed in hydrothermal environments mm. on Mars, but whether life ever existed on Mars and whether or not it resembles the microorganisms we have here is still a big question. We hope that our research steers the conversation uh, to prioritize search searching for signs of life in these environments. For example, there are some good targets on the crater rim of Jezero yeah. Crater which is where the Perseverance rover exactly. is right now. Yeah. yeah. So um, they know what they're looking for, basically, and this adds more evidence yeah. to it. And, of course, uh, there are other targets in our solar system, uh, such as the um, the ice moons that um, send up their yes. plumes from yeah. deep within. So there's, um, there's there's all sorts of possibilities. And as, as you and I have said before, we we – we're very hopeful that they will discover signs of past life on Mars and possibly life existing now in our solar system and, and hopefully within our lifetime that this will be proven. So uh, we, we wait with bated breath. But um, uh, if you want to read that whole article, it's on the phys, P-H-Y-S dot org website. It's a fabulous website. I, I visit it quite often and uh, full of great information and articles that are very, very highly esteemed in my opinion. And um, one more thing, of course, if you do want to get in touch with us, you can do that via our website and you can uh, send us messages there in either text or voice uh, styles. Uh, just um, click on the respective links to, uh, to get in touch with us, the AMA tab at the top or the record your question tab on the right-hand side at Space Nuts podcast.com or spacenuts.io. That brings us to the end of another episode. Fred, thank you so much. Great pleasure, Andrew. It was good to chat about these things, even though they might not make much sense. But <laughs> Who said so we happy. had to make sense? Oh, that yeah, wasn't yeah, part of the right. initial <laughs> idea. So anyway. <laughs> mm, all right. Thanks, thanks, Fred. We'll catch you next week. Fred Watson, yeah, astronomer at large. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for listening and Go the Bengal! Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.